Good morning. Welcome and thank you for coming out to join us this morning for the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies event on race, technology, and the future, setting the agenda. So thank you all for making the time. We hope you're able to stick with us for as much of the day as possible. Before we go much further, I want to uh, make a brief acknowledgement. Um, we are gathered on the ancestral land of the Nakatank, part of the Algonquin people, for whom the Anacostia River is named, as we share this space together to critically reflect on issues of race and technology, we begin by acknowledging both the displacement and forced relocation of indigenous peoples, as well as the connection to homelands that have endured through indigenous strategies of resistance. So again, thank you. My name is Charlton McElwain. I am the Vice Provost for Faculty Engagement and Development at New York University, where I'm also a Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication. Uh, I want to thank many people, some I'll do now. We'll reserve some thanks for many, many other people later on during the day. Uh, but I want to thank first our host, NYU DC, who uh, provided this fabulous location for our event this morning. And particular thanks to Tom McIntyre, the external uh, Director of External Relations, and Polly Terzian, Administrative Coordinator here at NYU DC. DC. I also want to thank many and all of the affili affiliates of the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. The center is made up of more than 50 scholars of color whose research, teaching, and public engagement place race at the center of our work on digital media technology. What it means to place race at the core of our understanding of technology and why it's necessary to place race at the center rather than at the periphery of today's most prominent controversies about digital technology is the focus of today's events. And so to set a backdrop for both the day and then introducing our uh, first panel, uh, I want to bring us a few words just from a uh, historical context. And I want to draw your attention to a headline the headline reads, Collision Course for Civil Rights and Automation. No, this is not one of the many headlines about Facebook fending off lawsuits because the platform enables the most egregious kinds of discrimination. Nor did it follow the recent news that TSA body scanners disproportionately flag black girls and women because of their hair. Neither was it about Google's location data dragnet that threatens to ensnare more innocent people of color. No, this headline above followed none of these recent conflicts about race, technology, and civil rights. But it could have. And what does it say about race, computing, technology, and civil rights today that this headline was written more than 50 years ago? On Thursday, August 6, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. But something else happened that week. A man whose name few of us probably have ever heard, certainly have not remembered, uttered prescient words from on high. Willard Wirtz was President Johnson's labor secretary. And just days before the signature civil rights legislation became law, he unceremoniously took to the pages of his weekly Labor Department newsletter to declare these words. Call it automation, cybernation, or age of the robots. The technological revolution is here and here to stay. Call it civil rights or equal opportunity or peaceable protest for freedom now. It is equally evident that the Negro revolution is here. In those few words alone, Wirtz recognized that civil rights and the new computer era were at odds, not just separated on different tracks, but destined for a collision that would leave one standing and the other mangled, decimated, damn near dead. More than 50 years later, the two are still at odds. And an even bigger collision awaits this time now that computer technology mediates almost every aspect 
of our daily, daily lives. Our civil rights forebears may not have read Norbert Wiener's cybernetics or cluttered their walls with engineering degrees or tinkered with computer code, but they did not have to. Being black in America fully equipped them to recognize that if we de develop new computational systems within the existing racial order, the machine would be designed to maintain white racial power. They could foresee how new computing machines, the hardware, the software, and those who developed them both would foreclose many black futures. And I'll end with this, perhaps Roy Wilkins, former president of the NAACP, his early capacity for engineering enabled and motivated him to think deeply and contemplate deeply the computer revolution's meaning for black people and other non-white people in the United States. Perhaps only someone who had witnessed firsthand both racial violence and hope could simultaneously transpose a deep sense of both optimism and pessimism onto the computer. If nothing else, certainly his journalist education and longtime work editing The Crisis, the publication that W.E.B. Du Bois began as the publication of record for the NAACP, are what allowed him to so adroitly frame the deeply probative question printed in the headline of his September 11, 1967 LA Times editorial. There Wilkins conjectured, conjectured, computerize the race problem? At the end of that essay, Wilkins wrote this. After the computer has defined on tape the ideal Holstein, could it not then turn its impersonal, unprejudiced magic upon our agonizing race problem? Could it not, after digesting the facts with whites and blacks have fogged over for so long, give us an outline of our obligation? Instead of being a measure of the Negro's lag, cannot the computer become a guidepost to interracial justice and peace? And so I want to end with that today as a setup and backdrop for uh, the world of discussion and expertise that we will uh, confront and engage with over the course of the day uh, from some of the most foremost experts on digital media technology uh, that have joined us uh, here in this room. Uh, so thank you again. And at this time, we'll begin to transition into our first panel. Uh, so if I can have our panelists come to the stage, and then I will start our introduction. While they are coming on stage, a couple of notes. When we get to the Q&A, uh, please wait for a microphone. There will be folks with microphones on either aisles coming over, so please wait for a microphone. Uh, before asking your question, uh, we ask you please, um, when you do uh, have a question, that you pose uh, a question and uh, refrain from giving long statements, comments, uh, et cetera. How's everything else? Everybody feeling good? All right. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be fun. I want to thank C-SPAN, who's in the room. Uh, one of my favorite networks. <laughs> All right. All right, we have everyone. Okay, our first panel, what's at stake, race and technology. And so we've asked uh, this group of uh, fine experts to uh, set up the day for us try to tell us a little bit from their own expertise and backgrounds why it matters to think about technology through the primary lens of race, and that'll come out uh, in a variety of ways. And to introduce the panelists, I will introduce our uh, esteemed moderator, Brandy Collins-Dexter, who is the Senior Campaign Director at Color of Change. Color of Change is the nation's largest online civil rights organization in the United States with more than 1.5 million members who use technology to fight for change. Brandy oversees their work in the areas of media, culture, and economic justice, including campaigns around tech accountability, privacy, Jim Crow, and anti-surveillance. And so please give a big warm welcome to this panel and to our moderator, Brandy. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, and thank you to the panelists. Um, Color Change has been a digital first organization since our founding. We know both the potential of the internet and the dangers of unaccountable platforms. We use technology to connect our members, to give voice to unheard stories, and to demand change from corporations, elected officials, and others. But right now what we're seeing is a concentration of control over communications platforms that are fundamental to daily life. Companies like Facebook, Google, YouTube, and Amazon are so large that being unable to safely use the platform is an unacceptable barrier to full participation in democracy, the marketplace, and civil society. And marginalized communities, as is often the case, are the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to engaging with, digi with the digital economy and communications platforms. So a couple of quick grounding facts. Black and brown people over-index on Twitter Instagram and WhatsApp, which are both owned by Facebook, and YouTube, which is owned by Google. Children, teens, people who are low income, and black and brown people, regardless of economic status, rely more on their smartphones than others as their primary device to use online sites and services. This means they may share detailed information about their whereabouts, their contacts, and their communications with the tech giants that provide mobile operating systems and applications, as well as third-party data mining companies. Black and brown people also over-index on Androids, often unable to afford the built-in anonymized data and encryption protections offered by iPhone. This leaves our communities grappling with how to engage with platforms not built for, operated by, or meant for us, but ones in which we routinely over-index on. And not only do we over-index on them, but we're also the tastemakers at the forefront of defining onto offline culture. So many of these platforms need us to exist, even as they allow white nationalism, voter suppression, predatory marketing, and data collection practices to thrive unchecked. So what does this mean? And what is the role of cutting edge research led by people of those communities and interrupting bad practices? I'm honored to facilitate this morning's panel. Um, for some reason, I tend to get the like 5 p.m. checkout panel, so I'm really excited to get the like morning one where people have had their coffee, it's moving its way to your veins. And I'm really excited for this panel and the folks on it. I wanna jump right into it, so I'm gonna start with some um, bios and if folks could give a wave as I, as I give your name. So first we've got Catherine Knight Steele. Dr. Catherine Knight Steele is an assistant professor of communication at the University of Maryland College Park and the director of the Andrew W. Mellon funded African American Digital Humanities Initiative. She earned her PhD in communication from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her research focuses on race, gender, and media with specific focus on African American culture and discourse in traditional new media. She examines representation in marginalized communities and media and how traditionally marginalized populations resist oppression and utilize online technology to create spaces of community. <clears throat> Next we have Dr. Desmond Upton Patton. Um, Dr. Patton is an associate professor at Columbia University. He is a public interest technologist, uses qualitative and computational data collection methods to examine the relationship between youth and gang violence in social media, how and why violence, grief, and identity are expressed on social media, and the real world impact these expressions have on the well-being of low-income youth of color. Dr. Patton is the founding director of the SAFE Lab, a member of the Data Science Institute and a faculty affiliate of the Social Intervention Group and holds a courtesy appointment in the Department of Sociology. Next we have Meredith Clark. Dr. Meredith Clark is an assistant professor at the University of Virginia where she studies intersections of race, media, and power. Her more recent work has focused on understanding, contextualizing, and analyzing the ways that black people have used digital and social media to build counter narratives to mainstream news narratives. Her research has been published in Journalism and Mass Communication Educator, the Journal of Social Media and Society, New Media and Society, and Social Movement Studies. In 2015, she was named one of America's most influential African Americans by the Route 100 list. She, an, she is an advisory board member for the Project Information Literacy at Harvard and is currently a co-PI on the Documenting Now, 
um, an Andrew W. Mellon grant-funded project that helps community-based activists create and maintain digital archives of their online work. And finally, we have Dr. Andre L. Brock. Dr. Brock <laughs> is an associate professor at Georgia Tech University. He is an interdisciplinary scholar with an MA in English and Rhetoric from Carnegie Mellon University and a PhD in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His scholarship includes public articles on racial representation in video games, black women in web weblogs, whiteness, blackness, and digital techniculture, as well as groundbreaking research on black Twitter. His article from the Black Hand Side, Twitter as Cultural Conversation, challenged social science and communication research to confront the ways in which a field preserved a colorblind perspective on online endeavors by normalizing whiteness and othering everything else, and sparked a conversation that continues as Twitter in particular continues to evolve. So thank you to my panelists for being here today. I'd love to start with an icebreaker question. So let's start light before we go deep. Um, I'd love for each of you to say, what is one digital source of joy for you? Everybody, everybody's looking at Andre, so. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll start and say that, um, and I think you've said this in your talk, um, Dr. Brock just gave a, a wonderful uh, keynote address at ICA this week, but um, sources of joy online are not hard for me to find. And I think that that's probably true for a lot of us in the room who have been online for a while and have taken great care in cultivating networks of support and care and joy and humor in spaces where others find misery and pain and hardship. And it's not that those things don't exist, it's just that if you encounter those things in your day-to-day -day life, you take great care in making sure that other spaces that you choose to be a part of don't also inflict that kind of violence on you daily. Um, and so one space of joy for me is black Twitter. It remains black Twitter. Um, it is not the same black Twitter that it was five years ago, but it still does the job in a pinch. Um, and so I think that cultivating joy online is something that is a necessity for black folks online. It's something that we take very seriously is our joy and our laughter in those spaces. So that's a, a space that I cultivate joy. So I uh, work with young people, and I think the thing that I find the most joy in that experience is their willingness to seek help when they need it, and to be vulnerable and uh, empathetic with one another, and to support each other during those rough times by either sharing the memes or participating in Black Twitter. Um, I think this has been probably the most um, um, exciting part of the work that I've been doing. I would have to say um, the space where I find joy online is the black beauty blogosphere um, and vlogosphere in particular, YouTube, turning on those beauty tutorials and seeing women of my complexion uh, engaging with the beauty products and really just having fun is a place that I like to hang out. Um, mine is twofold, uh, of course black Twitter, but in particular as a rhetorician, loving the way that people will continually reconfigure themselves through the use of their usernames. <laughs> so all of us do not do this, but I do. Uh, change my username on a regular basis depending on um, what, whatever strikes my fancy. So during the uh, Blacksonian issue uh, episode on Twitter, where the, the curatorship of Timothy Ann, I don't know Timothy Ann's last name, was questioned, I changed my username to Blue Check Thotiana. Uh, <laughs> and only some of the people in the audience get it, but that's okay, y'all are my people, right? <laughs> so that, that, that word play, that, that quick turn of phrase, especially in response to um, uh, things that are going on, I've called it in my book, Black Kairos, that, that part really amazes me. The other part is, uh, as a longtime YouTube watcher, watching uh, young groups of men in particular, but women as well, but young men totally uh, disregard um, uh, tropes of masculinity and engage in dance battles, right? So I grew up watching uh, Zulu Nation. I went to a couple of Zulu Nation things. And to see this, this same behavior where young men are battling one another and it's not about violence, it's simply about the expression through physical joy of their technical virtuosity and inventiveness, I love that. So that's my other source of joy. Thank you, that's great, that's lovely. Um, so thinking on that, um, if I were to say the term digital sanctuary, 
what would that conjure up for you? And <clears throat> let's actually work our way backwards. So let's start with uh, Dr. Desmond and work our way back. Okay, great. Uh, so sanctuary is a fraught concept because sanctuary implies that you have to have something to hide from, right? And one of the things I've enjoyed about Black Twitter and, and when I wrote about it early on was that although we see it as a third space, so Catherine and, both Catherine and Meredith have written about this, as a third space where people can retreat to meet like-minded people, the public-facing side of it means that everything they're saying is available for consumption by people who are not black. Nevertheless, black Twitter still remains a digital sanctuary in my mind, despite its public face, because even once the attention goes away, black people will still continue to be doing the things that they do. And so it's not so much a sanctuary in the sense that it protects us from the iniquities and the uh, disturbances of everyday life, but it's a space where we can revivify ourselves, right, from those iniquities in a, in a digital space. Oh, okay, so when I hear the word sanctuary, I think very literally to sanctuaries as um, in the black church, as someone who grew up in the black church and that being such an integral part of my upbringing um, and becoming such an integral part of the way that I imagine myself in digital spaces, the kind of respect and care and ethic that I bring to those kind of spaces that I recognize as sanctuaries for folks who are a part of them and what that means to be entering someone's sanctuary and the kind of respect that you need to give to that space. Um, so when I think of digital sanctuaries, I think of the black blogosphere, and I think of spaces that are gathered that are public, right, but they're semi-public, right? The black church is a public space, and anyone can walk into it at any time and receive welcome. Sometimes that welcome turns into very violent things, as we've seen, but that receive that welcome. And so it's public, but everyone doesn't walk into those spaces because there are things that happen in those spaces that are essential to the people who are there that make sense to specific communities that are there and don't make sense and don't have the same ethos for the folks that are outside of it. And so sanctuaries are these semi-public spaces that anyone has the authority to walk into, so to speak, but not everyone has the capacity to understand, to appreciate, to enjoy, and to treat with the kind of respect that it deserves. And so that's how I kind of imagine digital sanctuaries in the same way that we imagine those kind of church spaces that feel like home. Yeah, so for me, it's about uh, digital safety and protection. Um, and I'm in this really complicated space where the deep-rooted pain and trauma and stress that young people leave on social media is used um, to either understand their well-being or used against them to police or criminalize them. And for me, it's about how do you um, work with those communities in order to create spaces where they can be vulnerable and yet we can also be supportive through the different computational tools that we have as well, but that's super complicated. And so for me, it's about you know, who gets to use this data, how do we use the data, what are the guidelines and policies that we put in place to make sure that young people are protected. When I think about digital sanctuary, I think about what is constructed for the self um, and how we create our own spaces where we have some sort of enclaving, where we have a community that we've built. And so for me, a digital sanctuary is my personal community and the neighborhood within Black Twitter that I belong to where I have self-selected people that I want to be in community with. And so when I need to retreat from the physical world for a little bit, if I'm in a space that is particularly uncomfortable, be it while I am traveling or need to retreat from something that's happening on my campus, for instance, um, that is where I go. Those are the people who know me with whom I have established relationships over the years. They understand the coded language that I'm using in my tweets when I talk about the experience that I've had on a given day. They affirm that, they reaffirm it through the conversations that we have in offline spaces as well. So the community that I've structured for myself. Thank you. We're gonna get deeper into all of that stuff you bring up, but um, one of the last <clears throat> general questions I wanna ask is, <clears throat> apologies. I have been in a lot of spaces lately where there's a lot of conversations happening around the concept of privacy and what does privacy mean online. And I've heard people say that privacy, whether on or offline, is an illusion and that we no longer should expect to have it. I've heard people say that people of color have never really had it. 
Um, I would love to hear what you guys think about that. Is that true, not true, sort of true? Should privacy even be a goal for us when we talk about building online communities? And I wanna start with Dr. Clark and work down. Man, I would really like to pass the mic to Dr. Patton here. Yeah, and I, th I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Patton first because that is his, uh, his area of expertise, and I know when to stay in my lane. <laughs> yeah. Um, privacy is a complicated issue in this space for me because I'm... I kind of move between these two worlds where um, when we don't know enough, that can be problematic and when we know too much, it's used against us. And so how do we con construct the balance? And so I don't necessarily think that, um, let me back up. What I've learned from young people is that they curate um, ways of being private online and they're very sophisticated in doing that and they, and they choose how and when to be private. And there's some information that they want to be public for a variety of reasons. And I think understanding those points, those trigger points, those, those uh, those decisions, I think, are more important to me than than whether or not who, who we should be private, who gets to be private. Yeah, I think very often we use the term privacy as a blanket term, and we use it um, with the definition that we perhaps had in mind 10 years ago of what privacy meant to us or should have meant for us in a different context. And very often, I think, to your point, we ignore the ways that young people are thinking about privacy in ways that are actually more elevated and more complex than perhaps we were thinking about privacy 10 or 15 years ago. And that's not uh, the same as them not having a concept of privacy altogether. It's a different concept of privacy used differently and interspersed differently in different areas of their lives. And so we should really be looking to folks and asking folks about what their notions of privacy mean as we try to make recommendations to platforms and make recommendations to policy about those kinds of things of how people should be protected online. I, I can come back to this. I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, when I think about privacy, um, I think about the territories of the self. Goffman has talked about uh, territories of the self and this radiating kind of outwards from the individual. So you've got the territory of your own body, you've got the territory of your home space, and you've got territory of public space. And I think about online privacy in particular as one of these territories that we haven't necessarily defined in that way. So what is the self and how far does that go online and how far can you expect privacy to extend to you? Uh, I think the comments that are mentioned earlier about how people are structuring this notion for themselves is really important to think about. But also, I, I, I have this deep-seated misgiving about having any notion of privacy in this age, especially when you don't own the platform, you don't own the technology you're using, you don't even own the data that you're creating on these platforms. Uh, and so I think about privacy as, as being something that is a concept that perhaps is meant to make us feel better, but should probably be more complicated, complicated and complex when we think about it and think about how far it really pertains to the levels of the self. Uh, I'm glad I did let you go before me. Um, in many ways, I understand privacy as a modern construct um, and that uh, the United States didn't really decide on the definition of privacy until Brandeis, and I can't remember when Brandeis was adjudicated, right? But it's a Supreme Court case where uh, Judge um, uh, Louis Brandeis discusses what privacy means for individuals in their private homes, right? And I think in many ways the concept of privacy has been ill-fitted on top of the capacities of the digital platforms that we study, right? And so uh, in, the con in the context of mobile devices, <coughs> and the desire for privacy, that mobile device gives off information, the researchers are calling it data exhaust and data fumes, right? It's giving off information that you have literally no control over. It allows you to function with this device in a networked environment, right? And in, uh, without being, uh, being de-anonymized, it will de very much tell the patterns of your everyday life, right? How can you then expect to have an expect, how can you have an expectation of privacy when the very device in your pocket, the one you've entrusted your life to, snitches on you every seven, every seven <laughs> seconds, right? Uh, so that's one side of it. The other side for me too is, uh, I've argued against this for a couple of years, the idea of context collapse. And context collapse really does involve this really um, 
I'm gonna go ahead and say a white notion of what privacy is, the idea that you can be different people in different spaces, and it became really popular because uh, around the time that Twitter hit and they started talking about the possibilities that you could be seen as one person across your social media profiles, and I'm looking at it like, well, when have black people ever been able to escape context collapse? Du Bois says we are described in 1903 as one low-class, undifferentiated mass. Right? We never have had the, the, the possibilities, the affordances of being understood as individuals with individual needs, desires, and yearnings in separate spaces. And so for black people, I'm kind of where Meredith is, and this draws from my understanding of Derek Bell. I'm a realist, a racial realist about a privacy. I'm a privacy realist. Right? I understand it's something I should fight for, but that it's something that not just the technological spaces, but the juridical, the social, and the cultural milieus that I move in have determined that I'm never supposed to have access to. I'm always supposed to be a vessel of the state to be used for the state's uh, whims and, by extension, corporations' whims, because capitalism and the government are deeply intertwined. So mm. I don't think I helped with that answer. No, you did. That was great. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Brandeis. Actually, my um, mom, when she thought I was a boy, was going to name me Brandeis. Oh. And then when I turned out to be a girl, she named me Brandy. Side note, more than you needed to know about me. Um, so I, I want to like transition us to like specific questions around how black people have um, operated, used, and cultivated online spaces. And Dr. Steele, <clears throat> you talk about this idea of, of the virtual barber shop or beauty salon and, and discourse online, which I, I, I love that. As soon as you said that, I could immediately visualize what that was. But can you say a little more about what you mean when you say that? What has been the sort of evolution of oral communication and use of humor by black communities to crit critique the dominant culture? And since I like to ask like three questions in one, I'll, I'll throw in one more. And in, in as we talk about this concept of privacy, do you think that there's something lost or gained when um, our conversations are happening more out in the open in this public forum as opposed to the more closed space of a beauty salon? So yeah, so I started writing about what I deemed the digital barber shop some years back. Um, and I, I struggle with the use of the term virtual um, because virtual implies something that is not real, that is fabricated and that is separate from what we experience day to day. And so the original thought was that this was some kind of virtual space, right? But what was happening in these spaces that I deemed digital barbershops online, and at that time was talking about the black blogosphere, was as real as anything that happens face to face. And in some cases was much more real for the participants than what their day to day life proved to be. Proved to be. You have black middle class folks who by virtue of their education and their careers are surrounded by white folks all day long. They're in cubicles, in spaces where they do not encounter folks that look like them and have similar lived experiences. And where they do encounter those folks is at their desk, during their lunch hour, at the, at the screen, right? And so those spaces for folks became just as significant as, and as real as barbershops were in communities where folks were living in spaces when they were actually living together. So if I'm not living next to people who have my life experience anymore, if I'm not working next to people who have my life experience anymore, where do I go to have that similar kind of relational um, repertoire? Where do I go to cultivate my knowledge about black community and black aesthetic? Where do I do that besides online spaces? So digital barbershops serve that purpose, but they also serve the same purpose that barbershops served for proprietors of those spaces. They were resources where people could use the talents and the skill sets that they had to um, draw in community together, but also to make money. Right? And this became true more and more over time that folks who became very good at these spaces online were copying their trends now in terms of branding and Instagram folks who are making lots of money by being influencers. But black folks have been doing this for a long time online, which is cultivating communities of followers that are deeply invested in high context discourse about specific subject matter um, based on lived experience, not with people that they grew up next to, but that they had the same life as <laughs> across the web. Um, and so that's where the digital barbershop kind of comes from. And I, I like to look at the blogosphere for that because I think it's very indicative of what we see happening in social media patterns afterwards, right? So we can't start by studying Twitter. We can't start, I say, by studying WhatsApp to think about the things that happened beforehand. And it is in those spaces that we see like remnants of orality, on calls the secondary orality and this transference of 
oral culture to online spaces, where black folks have been doing things like signifying, have been doing things like practicing orality for generations. And the digital allows for a space where that kind of skill set is actually celebrated, where that kind of skill set is actually necessary. Um, I think Meredith said this at the start, but it's, it's important that these spaces are actually, uh, they require blackness in order to operate, right? Hashtags were not hashtags before black folks got a hold of them, right? And they didn't mean what they meant until black folks did what they did with them. Um, so I think your third question was about privacy and about whether or not these kinds of online iterations of offline spaces grant us the same kind of uh, community that they could before. And I think this is where it becomes interesting in um, what Zora Neale Hurston calls the absence of the concept of privacy, right? And talks about how black folks have always had to live out in the open, have always had to interrogate themselves and their community while in front of an audience, and have been able to do that in ways that still cultivate that community and still find ways to cultivate senses of self even while being vessels of the state, cultivate senses of community even whilst being under the eye of watchmen, right? And so um, what I would say is that online, the same kinds of practices are occurring, the same kinds of ways of using discursive patterns that make context necessary for participation happen in online realms. So are things lost by us moving online? I think misses the point that we are, we are already always moving to new mediums and new platforms to do the same kind of iterative work that we've always done as a black community. The online world is the space that we're doing that in now. Thank you. I love that you brought up Zora Neale Hurston because I actually found myself thinking of her um, as I was reading your research, Dr. Brock. Zora Neale Hurston was often critiqued by contemporaries and younger writers like Richard Wright for being sort of too open, uh, talking about black identity experiences and bodies and all of our complexities in ways that could be consumed and critiqued by the white gaze. Basically, people felt like she was too ratchet. Um, <laughs> You've talked about the complex reactions to the appropriateness of Twitter as a black cultural outlet, one of the critiques being that it's an active facilitator of deficit-based black cultural stereotypes. Can you speak a little more to that? I can. Um, if you're feeling it, or you can, can answer no, no, another no, question. I got you. Whatever, um, you're extra. So, I was having this conversation with my friend Kevin on the way over, and one of the things that came up was a lot of your research agenda as an academic of color is around who you are, right? And so I uh, was a child of military slash working class parents, and then I got thrust into graduate school, which is not where a lot of the people who acted like me were. And so I've become increasingly fascinated with the concept of the black everyday. And the everyday, in many ways contains a lot of the ratchet, or the, as I've been calling it, ratchetry, right? That we don't necessarily like to acknowledge in polite spaces, right? But uh, I mean, if you look at the viewership for Real Housewives of Atlanta, say, right? Many of those women who love that show in other spaces are very much professional women holding down corporate jobs with a lot of responsibility, right? But there has to be that space where you can express the sensual side of what it is that you do, right? Uh, for me, as I started writing about Twitter, I realized that Twitter was also an inappropriate space for conversation, right? It was not email. It was not the business-oriented messaging apps that were popular at the time, right? It certainly wasn't Facebook or MySpace because it was a microblog, and this is why I appreciate Catherine's focus on blogging. I think we need to pay more attention to that, right? But it was a space where people could follow people who are of interest and talk about things that concerned them at that moment in the everyday and people could respond, right? Um, and so uh, one of my favorite, um, oh, I won't say that one here. One of my other favorite. <laughs> say it, say it. <laughs> so a day that went down in infamy, I'm sorry, C-SPAN. A day that went down in infamy, uh, January 6, 2017, was that uh, soon after the inauguration, should I say coronation of 45, <laughs> Uh, of the organization for uh, 45, Yahoo Business, which has a Twitter account, said that Trump was going to need to acquire more money for military spending. Uh, they were specifically using a photo of the Navy, and so they said Trump is going to need a nigger Navy in order to pursue his military aims. Now, the, it didn't last long. That tweet was up maybe 20 minutes before they caught the error. Black Twitter, however, found it because we are a screenshotting culture, right? <laughs> it's something that goes on with something I could talk about later called keeping the receipts. Right, uh, And instead of finding it a moment of affront, 
Like in many cases, people accuse Twitter of being this space for uncivil discourse and mob mentality, where like Twi Oprah says, don't get Twitter mad, you don't want them. Like, no, get Twitter mad. They get really funny when they do. Uh, and so they took this term, nigger navy, made it into a hashtag, and then began posting all of these memes about what a ratchet navy would actually look like. <laughs> Right, and so they had the picture of LeBron, Dwayne Wade, uh, Chris Brosh, and Mello on a float in the middle of the Miami Harbor. Right, one of my favorite ones. I don't know where this picture came from. This, is, this young lady in Atlanta posted a woman sitting in her bikini and a snorkel mask and a lawn chair under the underwater, completely underwater, talking about waiting for my man to come back from the nigger nigger. Right. And so that's not the type of stuff, like as much as I love blogs and, I, and Catherine and I are gonna write about blogs, right? Uh, they were not able to have that quick comeback, that quick presentation of, of, of stuff that was immediately resonant, right? They built an audience and then they published things on a regular basis. Twitter has the capacity of Kairos, like when you publish it, people respond to it in the moment and it just keeps building on and on. So this idea of appropriate and inappropriate computer mediated communication platform coupled with the sensual embodied cognition of a community that is always ready to crack a joke, right? I think made it that space that is of, still of compelling interest to me. Um, I mean, we could just go on and on with examples of how Twitter has um, made fun of uh, uh, certain things. And I think that's really the point. Uh, for me, Twitter is a libidinal space, and I argue about this in my book. The fact that Twitter encourages this sort of ritual catharsis, right? Ritual in the sense that you know you only have so many words and maybe an image coupled with your username at the time to promote to your audience, and you have to express something in a way that will resonate with one another. And catharsis is a thing that works, whether it's joy, which Catherine and I talk about in various ways, or it's pain, right? The continued reposting of state sanctioned. Uh, uh, violence against black bodies. But those things built up to the political moments that I think Color of Change is interested in, right? Uh, but without it, that stuff doesn't happen. And the blogs found that out really early on, right? So when you think about the 2008 election and the 2006 Democratic Convention, where Jack and Jill politics and a couple other blogs were like, why aren't we represented at the thing? And it's like, well, you have this very small audience. Right, an influential small audience of highly educated black people, but you haven't reached the wider thing. And, and although it was dismissive of the Democratic National Convention to shut them out, it actually was kind of accurate. They didn't have that representation. Twitter, the fact that people come to play on Twitter means that it has a wider audience for people to interact with and build around those moments of inappropriateness and then build up to a respectable possibility. There's, there's a lot of threads there that I wanna pull on and we'll come back to. But I do think as much as we talk about and appreciate Twitter as this space, this like general space of like turning pain into humor, there's also there's also a dark side to that too, right? And and Dr. Patton, um, a lot of your research is around the ways in which gang involved youth conceptualize threats on social media and the extent to which social media shapes and facilitates gang violence. Um, can you speak more to that? And also, what role do you think platforms should be playing in, um, in, in dealing with what they're seeing on their platform and mitigating the damage? Yeah, so I'm a social worker, and I was brought to this space, this work, um, from young people. So I am a youth violence researcher, and I was spending time with a group of young black men from the west side of Chicago, and they were like, have you heard what's happening on Twitter? This is in 2012. And there was a beef between little, uh, two rappers, and one rapper posted his location, uh, and within about three hours, he was killed in that exact space. And so I became really interested in the role of social media in gun violence, particularly in the city of Chicago. Um, but like an eager uh, academic, I, I think for myself, I was looking for and asking the wrong questions. I, I was really interested in the role of aggression and threats and retaliation in social media communication. How do you find that and what are the best methodologies and strategies for doing that? And, and in doing that, I missed people. I missed stories, I missed, I missed humanity, I missed grief, I missed um, the complexity of the lived experience. And so I um, found this young woman, Ja'Kyra Barnes, in 2014. Her story made uh, 
uh, headline news because she was a young girl who allegedly had shot a kill up to 17 people by the time she was 17. She had this mythology online because she was very similar to little Snoop from The Wire. Um, and so I started off with just trying to understand her life on Twitter and people who she was connected with. But like a, <laughs> uh, an amazing black woman, she let me know who she was through Twitter. Um, and I saw so much um, love and empathy and joy and pain and violence and aggression that I couldn't just look at one thing anymore. And so my research dramatically changed because of this young black girl, um, because she f forced me to reckon with um, who gets to be human in this world. Um, and so I needed to try on different methodologies to looking at large swaths of data. So I partnered with data scientists to use machine learning to look at large amounts of data. And the reality was none of the gold standard techniques worked on the communities that we work in, none of them. And the reality is young black kids from Chicago had to redevelop and train these algorithms to actually be effective at looking at their language. But then there's also this question of, well, should you be decoding the language in the first place? And I wrestled with that because in my world, I wrestled with digital ethics in my space, period, because I feel like I'm always told what ethics are, but when I talk to you know, a black mom who just lost their daughter or a black father who just lost their son, they want the most, um, they want all the tools that are gonna keep their kids safe. So that means coding social media every single day, using machine learning to keep the kids safe, that's exactly what they want. And they have no problem with that whatsoever. Then on the other end, there's a very real understanding that you know, social media could be the new apparatus for mass incarceration. And so how do you balance that in this space? And so in my work, when I'm consulting with different social media platforms, you know, for me, it's always about do no harm and how do we um, work with communities, right? So not just um, tapping into the community, but actually be co-collaborators in this space. And that's a challenge. And so there are a lot of great folks who are mid-level working social media platforms that are inter interested in this work, but once it reaches up, it doesn't go anywhere because it doesn't make money to actually keep kids safe online. It's not a feature, it's not a policy, it's not going to make the money. And so that there's a real tension there with how do you actually keep kids safe online in a way that people are going to reckon with. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, I definitely want to come back to that. But I, I also, we've spent a lot of time talking about us and how um, black folks are sort of building community online. But um, the truth is that it's not just us that are, that are finding each other and building community, right? Um, I mentioned earlier that black and brown people were some of the early adopters of new technology, but at the same time um, that we were discovering and leveraging that technology, another group was also exploring it, white nationalists, who were also um, early adopters of new technology and um, a lot of listservs like Stormfront and other ones. Um, have it, had existed since the 90s. Um, I wanna come to you, Dr. Clark, because 50 years ago, it's been a little over 50 years ago, the Kerner Commission, which was convened by President Johnson, released a report on the root causes of civil unrest that took place across the country in 1967 in black neighborhoods. Their findings included a damning critique of media. And one of the things that I remember from election night 2016 is like how shocked mainstream media outlets seem to be by the rise and election of Trump. Whereas, you know, I would say, and maybe others, that if you were paying attention, there was a lot of things that you were seeing unfolding online that would have told you where we were going. So Dr. Clark, I wanna come to you. Can you talk a little bit about um, why you think so much of mainstream media missed the Trump wave? Yes, so I, I appreciate the connection between the Kerner Commission report of 67, 68 and the moment of the election in, in 2016 and even where we're sitting right now. Uh, one of the critiques that the Kerner Commission laid out was the reason that there was civil unrest in these urban centers in Detroit and Cleveland, Baltimore, Oakland in 67 was because news media had failed to adequately cover black communities and their description for that was getting news media to identify, hire, 
train and retain black journalists in the newsroom so that we could have dominant news media narratives that were more accurately reflective of black communities. Uh, they were still a little bit myopic with that because they were talking about this in terms of black communities as the ghetto, as though there was not any other type of black community in the country. And I think that that myopic focus is the same thing that we saw replicated in 2016 uh, during the election, that you were so busy focusing on one group of people, you forgot about everyone else. So you've got this archetype of the working class American who is galvanized by Trump, who feels like they haven't been heard, that life is passing them by, that they're at the tail end of this line, that they're supposed to be at the front of. Of, and you are surprised because you've been focusing on that person and not thinking about how um, white nationalists in particular are organizing in digital media spaces, are inflaming tensions, and are essentially mobilizing people to also vote for Trump. So you, you miss this other audience that was in another place. Uh, the thing about that was the same problem that impacted the media in the 60s impacted the media in the new millennium. Had you had more people of color, more black people in particular, in newsrooms, they could have told you about essentially what was going to happen if Trump was elected. And there are a couple of ways that we saw that play out. We saw the hashtag your slip is showing in 2014, where black feminists were able to point out, hey, there's something wrong with this series of accounts on the web. You need to pay attention to this. And years later, with big data analysis, we now find out that Russian intelligence was behind some of these accounts. And so we're moving people and playing with their affect to get them to think and to vote in a particular way. You also had journalists in newsrooms who could have told you about the stories that you were missing when you think about the working class American being synonymous with white working class. Like what about everyone else, all of the people of color, all of the immigrants, all of the folks who make up this working class who do not identify with the Republican nominee. And so you see this, this shortfall repeat itself. Uh, not having the news media be properly integrated, but beyond being integrated, not having people of color in positions, editorial positions, that allow them to direct coverage. Kerner prescribed getting more black folks in the newsroom, but it's possible to stack the newsroom with black people and put them all at entry level positions and not change your coverage at all. So the thing that the media continues to miss is this proper integration of people of color and people from diverse backgrounds and putting them in positions that allows them to make uh, the kind of editorial decisions that give coverage that better reflects the American reality rather than catering to the interests of elite white men. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. I think a lot about um, what are some of the different moments that we missed. And I think one big one that showed what was coming was Gamergate, which was a harassment campaign launched in 2014 that targeted several women and people of color in the video game industry. And in fact, to this day, white nationalists and men's rights groups are actively recruiting video gamers still. Um, so Dr. Brock, you've done a lot of work around this. Um, I, wanna, I wanna come back to you. Can you speak more to this phenomenon and what we're seeing? Why is this the right place for recruitment? And what are some of the racial and gender representations that we're seeing in video games? So, this might help. Uh, so the connection to the Kerner Commission is a good one since Gamergate was ostensibly about ethics and game journalism, right? And so that was one of the reasons why they mounted their campaign campaigns of harassment against Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian and others. But I want to point out something that's of, of interest as well. And so in the tech industry, so your mention of uh, a specific type of working class voter um, uh, is, has always been of interest to me as the media framed it because it turns out that many of the uh, Republican voters are well off right, live in suburban areas. They are not the benighted coal miners and service center, uh, call service center workers in Ohio. They're the people in the enclaves outside of Atlanta and DC, like Virginia, right, who are voting for Trump. And so it's not the uneducated white working class voter that's moving for him. It's these folk who have achieved a certain level of capital 
in many different ways, right? And see that Trump is able to also um, validate their libidinal impulses that drove them to achieve this capital in the first place. And I say that because if you look at the ways in which uh, the alt-right, which is a sexy term, white racist, white racial supremacy has propagated uh, since uh, the media era, uh, you could look back at the libertarian uh, newsletters of Lyndon LaRouche, Ron Paul, right, uh, and others who were circulating these documents about mud people and uh, the dirty Jews and the control of the banking industry, the Rothschilds, right, long before the internet existed. And I'm also here referring to Jesse Daniels' canonical work on cyber racism, right, where she pointed out sites like American Renaissance, uh, Stormfront, and others that picked up on the um, social scientific research by, I should not remember this guy's name, and, I, and so I won't. Um, and use these uh, pseudo-scientific methods to continue to recruit people through online mechanisms where they could, like the black people, uh, go, fi go find people who w had been uh, silenced by their lack of proximity to other people who thought like them. Because for a moment, a shining moment, it wasn't okay to talk about race uh, dismissively or pejorative in public. Right, and so these, and Spike Lee, as much as I hate to give him credit, the Black Klansman movie really picked up a lot of that, right? The ways in which they were clandestinely meeting in order to promote these things. So Gamergate, and the reason why I bring up libertarianism is the tech industry has a strong streak of libertarianism. If you look back at Ted Nelson, if you look back at a lot of the people who are foundational to both user interface design, coding practices, coding languages, uh, and object-oriented programming, these folk are libertarians first and foremost. And so they believe in certain forms of living a government of which racism and sexism are really not to be regarded because those are personal affairs and not something the government should meddle in. So imagine if you have a group of people who are already predisposed to not thinking that racism is important, already being uh, confronted with, not confronted, exposed to libertarian ideas about uh, what the polity should look like in terms of its whiteness and purity, right? And then you add in a second layer of less informed people who just play video games. You get Gamergate. And Gamergate was actually presaged uh, from a fan perspective by uh, an event called Race Fail, which happened in 09. Those of you who may use LiveJournal may remember how Race Fail went, right? But it was basically uh, a few authors like Kay Tempest Bradford and a couple of others who pointed out the overwhelming whiteness and imperialism of science fiction and fantasy. And the science fiction fans, many of whom are tech bros and Star Wars geeks, and sci -fi, you know, they lost their minds, right? They're like, of course we should have green people. But every time you want to put a brown person in a situation, I cannot tolerate that. That's just destroying. <laughs> that is destroying the fantasy that I have about other worlds. I like, and I always love this phrase, I like anybody where they're red, green, black, or purple. Who do you know that's purple? <laughs> like, where are you getting this purple thing from? Okay, so uh, I digress. But in any case, uh, Gamergate uh, traded upon um, the already established networks of uh, promoting white supremacy clandestinely through internet networks and the na naivete of gamers who simply wanted a form of play that they could immerse themselves in that in validated their entire lifespan. So we're talking about Lord of the Rings, right? We're talking about uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones, right? We're talking about a number of big properties, the Marvel Universe, right? Where whiteness is ascendant, it is empowered, uh, it is moral, right? And it is dedicated to fighting against the forces of darkness, right? In every aspect. I mean, you could put Star Wars back in there. If you remember the controversy about Ray and I can't remember John Boyega's character, right? How, how dare you have brown people and women in, as Jedi, right? Like, it, it just threw it off. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done, I swear. Um, Gamergate is interesting in part, your ship is showing, was generated because there was a Gamergate campaign that was coordinated with 4chan where they said, let us build sock puppet accounts to emulate black activists on Tumblr specifically and on social media, right? And they failed at it terribly. Uh, but they still continue to do it, and the Russian troll farms, the Ukrainian troll farms, the Chinese troll farms have picked up on that technique and become increasingly sophisticated. So during the 2016 election, they had an account called Blacktivist on Facebook, right, which garnered millions of followers, but which the media, once again missing the boat because they had no black people in their newsrooms, assumed that it was done to, prom to sway black people to vote uh, in particular ways. But Blacktivist really was not for black people. It was for white people who had 
uh, tangential contact with black people so that they could be offended by all these things that, that black people were asking for, like reparations. Right? And so in that, in that case, it was startlingly effective. If you look at the shares, and Desmond has better data on this than I do, if you look at the shares, there's no way black people could have shared that much information about this one account. This is reshares by white people of a certain age, 45 to 60, those who are landed gentry and otherwise professional, blue collar and white people, uh, bite collar uh, workers, right, who shared this thing because it spoke to their inner fears of xenophobia, of loss of resources and the like. And so games are an entry point uh, in many cases now, the media has turned to a new sort of, sort of panic. Your children are getting recruited out of fork knife. Um, <laughs> right? But in many cases, that's also because they don't understand the meaning of what Fortnite and, and uh, Overwatch, and I play a game called The Division, uh, which is also a, me shooting brown people, right? Those are spaces where people gather, but much of the game itself is you being social in that space, right? But if one of the things I talk about in my work overall is that that space that you're in online mediates the type of person that you're going to be in that space. So if you're going to space to shoot people who are brown and somebody wants to talk to you about how that brown guy took you out with a well-placed sniper headshot, but he's a loser and you just didn't know what was going on at the time, that is a, a, a cathartic space for you to build empathy to then recruit somebody to your cause. So while I'll lay the blame to a certain extent at the paucity of genre in games where the only interaction is shooting people, for the most part, these are sophisticated organizations who have used online media to recruit folk over and over again for the last 30 years, not just since uh, games have become popular enough to be a vehicle for that type of expression. That was a lot, sorry. That was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot. Where do I go? Um, how much time do we have left? Um, this is class, doggone yeah, it. I know, I feel like I'm back in school. School me, it's cool. Um, so I guess I'm thinking of all of this that we just said, and I'm thinking about one, this through line of the mistrust of media, which for black folks and many folks have existed since that's, that was one of the findings from the Kerner Commission, right? That there was like this deep mistrust of mainstream media and their ability to tell our stories. And it's something that persists to this day. Even when I think about, um, we talked about like Chicago, the way that I'm from Illinois. Um, my family's from Chicago, I grew up in Champaign. And I think of how even Chicago has been weaponized and used as a sort of code language for like violent, wild black people. And I think of all of this stuff that we're seeing and experiencing in the era of like sort of police videos and what that's meant in terms of how that's changed in our understanding of policing and police brutality. So I, I mean, I wanna come back to you Dr. Clark, and ask you, do you think social media is sort of an adequate replacement for traditional media reporting? And or has social media made us, um, in fact, more desensitized to our trauma? Okay, so no, I, I do not think that social media is uh, any kind of replacement for traditional reporting. What social media does well, what those tools and those platforms do well is allow many people to be a part of news media conversations all at the same time. However, um, as a recovering journalist and someone who still believes in the power, and the influence, and specifically the responsibility of the fourth estate uh, to cover the news, to cover it adequately and fairly, and to cover it as a function of liberal democracy, I am still a supporter of an approach to journalism that is professionalized, that holds itself to specific standards, and that the public can hold accountable by those standards. And so while social media provides an opportunity for there to be more speakers, which is something that we definitely need, um, it is not in any way, in, in my view, uh, a replacement for media, mainstream media, um, or specifically professional journalism. We have, answered this question before, historically. Uh, one of the things that, and it goes back further than, than the Kerner Commission, I throw back um, to the 19th century with the founding of Freedman's Journal, and the reason that uh, Samuel Russworm and John Cornish founded the first newspaper run by free black men was specifically because of the way they saw media 
portraying black people at that time, that they would focus on deviance in black communities and use that to generalize what blackness was, that blackness was always deviant, that it was criminal. And we see that through line all the way to this moment. What social media allows us to do is to push back against that narrative and against that framing in real time and to show that this institution of law enforcement and policing that is ingrained in the American psyche as being something that is a controlling agent, that is fair, that is there for the protection of all citizens, when we know this is not the case, uh, does not work that way for folks from marginalized communities. And so we need social media to provide that witnessing. Dr. Alyssa Richardson talks a lot about this in her work on the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we need social media to provide the witnessing that journalists often cannot provide. Because when we capture a video out in the field, we need to consult with an editor and say, what part of this video can we show? This video is graphic. We have to think about the breakfast test. Are people going to want to see this? Are they going to be able to withstand it and stomach it while they're eating their breakfast in the morning? How do we need to edit this, frame this for our public, for the public that we serve? Social media and those people who are on the spot and able to capture this don't have that problem. And we need to see the reality of what it's like for black bodies to be targeted, surveilled, policed, broken, uh, so that people understand exactly how grave these issues are. So I think that these two things work well together. They complement one another. Journalism can provide context. It can provide history when it's doing its absolute best. Uh, but social media provides the complement and context that we need from people in the field. Thanks. So I know I, I'm sure folks have questions, but I, I just I, I want to like get in two more questions and then I, I wanna um, leave time for folks to ask questions. And so I wanna, I wanna get to this point. So, so you talked a lot about um, the importance of these like online spaces um, as a means to kind of like express humor, culture, um, to process trauma and to sort of live out loud. Um, Dr. Steele, You've done a lot of work around processing tragedy online. And, and I'm curious what you what it means. Can you talk more about what it means for us to organize out loud in the midst of trauma? And how do you place that in um, a historical and modern context? So most recently, um, I've been working with uh, Jessica Liu on notions of death and um, trauma as it relates to notions of joy and putting those things on the same research agenda because they're happening simultaneously. Because at the same time that we're always processing our trauma, we are always processing our joy. And it's really important that we don't study those things as discontinuous, as separate kinds of ways that we enact online and separate kinds of ways that we enact in, in media, uh, uh, unmediated spaces, right? In spaces where we're talking to each other because we don't do it that way. We're, we're doing all the things at the same time. While we were writing our last piece on the campus of the University of Maryland, uh, Army Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III was murdered by one of our students while he was visiting friends on campus in what is an apparent hate crime. Um, this was happening while we were gathering tweets about joy. And we had to sit with that for a moment because we were making the case that what folks were doing online was exactly that, was that we were constantly bombarded with images of pain and videos of murders, not of random strangers, but of people who looked like our brothers and our cousins and our friends. And that that meant something to the folks who were constantly processing that pain. And it meant something to us as researchers to be processing that murder on that campus while we were talking about iterations of how we push back against that with joy. Um, and so I think that as we consider processing trauma online, we can't do it in such a way where we think about um, these videos outside of the context in which they occur in our daily lives. We're reading these videos, we're viewing these images as we are doing the other things that we have to do to stay alive in our society. And therefore, what we become very good at is processing this pain alongside processing our regular lives. And so as we do that in our research, I suggest that we do the exact same thing, that we don't think about these as discontinuous events. Um, and this is, I think, something that Desmond spoke to as well. The methods and the ethics that we currently have in place sometimes ask us to do these things very separately, to look at instances of violence separately than we look at instances of humor. And that we, we see these 
as researchers as separate spaces. We see these as platforms as separate spaces, but whole human beings are engaged in these practices. And whole human beings as researchers, therefore, need to approach these persons online in the same kind of context of sharing in those moments of joy and pain as, as contiguous things. Thank you. So last question I have, um, a little bit different, but I think kind of related. Um, Dr. Patton, you talk a lot around artificial intelligence and how it's used in, in, in social work. And when I first heard that, um, the concept of like sort of art of AI and, and social work, I'm like, huh, that almost seems like a oxymoron or things that are kind of like on the opposite end of the spectrum. But um, from, from your standpoint, how has AI and social work sort of made things better? What are some new challenges? And, and where does sort of privacy and da data collection considerations come into play in that work? So the linkages between AI and social work are very, very new, and so there isn't a lot to say. But what I can say is that the few folks that are embarking on this journey are really thinking about how, what are the most rigorous and um, uh, uh, mo most robust ways that we can continue our research on the most pressing social problems, but in the way for which we can collect data and optimize new ways of providing intervention and uh, treatment opportunities. And so in the communities that I'm a part of and, and in my own work, we're trying to think through what are the best strategies for providing uh, the most robust treatment for folks who are in communities and spaces where treatments are few and far between. And so there is work out of USC that are trying to create algorithms to optimize how to provide uh, support for homeless individuals through uh, optimization algorithms. And in my own work, we are trying to partner with uh, outreach organizations that do uh, violence work in Chicago to provide them with real-time social media data, not about people, but about events, moments, and experiences that allow them to augment their outreach efforts um, in a way that takes into consideration the things that are happening online. And that particular strategy was birth from their own interests. They understood that there was so much happening online and they would have people looking at things online, but it wasn't the best use of their human capital. And so they were interested in ways in which they could use AI to support their work as well. Um, there's a, but there's a, a, a big uh, open challenge with the use of AI. I guess many people don't really know what that means in social work spaces. We have different ways of, of of understanding it and explaining it in these communities. And we, again, we, ha we have to think through uh, the best ways to involve communities in the development of AI technologies. And so oftentimes that becomes uh, the, uh, the work of annotators and labelers that are uh, helping us to identify these nuanced and hyperlocal uh, uh, language in this space, um, but then again, they're not paid well. They are uh, not uh, be, be not able to leverage this expertise in a way that actually leads to um, a new career in technology. So I think that there are there's a lot of room for opportunity in terms of you know what are the best ways to cook to connect and partner with communities to develop AI that is for the community that they own, um, but also to critique the ways in which AI is deployed in their communities as well. Thank you. You guys covered a lot. I feel like each thing you guys said could have been almost its own panel, um, but thank you. I want to see if folks in the audience have any questions. We've got a few minutes, and so we, we can stack a few. Hi, um, I've got a question for Dr. Clark, um, sort of about the statement you made about the limits of the Kerner Commission and sort of your call to include more journalists of color in like executive positions. And I'm wondering if you could expand on like some of the limits of that as well. So I'm thinking specifically about sort of the journalistic norms that journalists of color learn at J school, whatever, that like may not serve their best interests, so the things you're kind of asking for but that they've internalized and sort of have to unlearn and how to do that. And secondly, I'm thinking about just a structural problem. So the fact that even if you have executive, people in executive positions, they still like media capture, they still always somebody above that person. They have things like conceptualizing audiences and advertising money and things like that. And then there are all these other pressures too. So I'm wondering if you could expand more on sort of how we address that, even when we have 
uh, people in the positions that we want them to have. Just real quick, because I know we're low on time. Do other folks have questions so we could just stack a couple? All right, okay, Kerner, go for it. Okay, so uh, this actually, thank you for the question. It, it relates to work that I'm doing with Black Twitter and thinking about Black Twitter and the creation of counter narratives as offering suggestions for how new media should shift and change. And specifically focusing on the norms and values that the American media systems have in place, news media systems in particular. Uh, so first there's this dichotomized way of thinking about American news media, that either you are an objective observer and reporter, or you an, are an activist doing this sort of work. And where people of color are concerned, especially black folks in the United States, we come from this history as the press being a source of activism and advocating on behalf of people who don't see their narratives written and uh, reported properly. That dichotomy, I argue, is false. Uh, the idea of objectivity and the normalization of so-called objectivity is created in a time when black people were not allowed to learn how to read or write. They were not in the room thinking about what are we going to privilege as being newsworthy. Women weren't even in the room at that time. And so thinking about how during this age when the creative destructive powers of the internet are redefining for us how information can be gathered and reported and how it can be disseminated to different groups and, and the number of ways that we can shift there, taking advantage of this moment to learn from groups who are using the internet for their own communicative purposes of exchanging information and providing information that people use to live their everyday lives, which is the definition of news. Um, learning from them to create and develop new values to inform the way that we go about reporting. The United States, the press in the United States has a big problem with trust. Uh, Alicia Garza and the Black Census Project just released their numbers this morning. The report is on the New York Times site. And you can see among black people in the United States the sum I believe somewhere between 30 and 50,000 that they surveyed, there is a big trust gap between black Americans and the news. And so that says to me that we need to think about doing this differently. And if there were no other time than to think about the ways that we can reshape these norms and values, that time is now. The other problem there that uh, you mentioned is about actually the, the people themselves, right? And who goes into the newsroom and, and how these jobs are being formed. I now run the American Society of News Editors annual newsroom diversity survey, and it takes into account the demographics of newsrooms across the country. Uh, one of the big problems that we had was that newsrooms are not defined the way that they used to. They used to be. There used to be a brick and mortar newsroom where people showed up every single day. And while that's still the case in a number of places, the Gray Lady is still standing, the Washington Post still has a building that's still standing. Um, um, when we think about what the internet has done and allowed people to report from the field in a number of different places and not necessarily all be in the same place, we can think about how people in those roles can change as well so that we don't necessarily need to have the same hierarchical structures that we had reinforced by this building with a person who was an editor who had an office over here, a reporter who had a desk or a cubicle over here, those roles changing, and so allowing people to have more power, not only in terms of the structure, uh, the physical structure, but also the editorial structure that they take on. Any other questions? Yep. So I just wanted to ask you all We've talked a lot, or you all have talked a lot about um, what you think has happened wrong, but what are your things along kind of future lines that you all are worried about, um, e keeping 2020 in mind or just with the internet in general? Before you take the microphone, could you clarify a little bit on what you want, what you're asking? 
So for instance, like I work on algorithmic bias issues for um, Committee on Education and Labor. And so what we're worried about and I'm worried about going forward is like changing work structures as it relates to AI, right? Um, kind of future looking, like going ahead and as opposed to, so Title VII will then be taken into account in that way, where it's just like instead of suing a company or a person for violating Title VII, you're going to be suing an AI bot. How does that work? And that's what I mean by like, what do you guys think about kind of like future issues? Like what are things that you guys are coming up on or thinking about that you guys would, fra sorry, framing it differently. What are some of the issues that you all are thinking are coming up that we're not thinking about and we need more thought on, um, specifically in the realm of the internet and social media? Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'm still not answering. <laughs> so in, uh, in my world, there's this notion that if it doesn't lead to an offline event, a uh, physical altercation or some form of uh, physical violence, that it's not an issue. And I'm uh, very concerned that we don't care about what people are consuming online and how that's affecting their everyday psychology, how they think about themselves, their community, and other people as well. So I think there should be some real concerns about the, um, about um, how much we are consuming, and in particular around things of things like violence and threats and aggression, um, and, and how that's affecting um, just the uh, the everyday digital experience that young people are having online. So one thing that uh, I've been thinking a lot about now, I'm working on a, a manuscript on digital black feminism, and so I've been thinking a lot about things like your slip is showing, and thinking a lot about how black women have historically done the work uh, and the labor that's involved in um, trying to save America from itself continuously and been ignored in that regard for many years in, in doing that work, and now recently not being ignored. And what it means to have a lot of the labor that black women do become popularized as catchphrases like listen to black women and black women told you. And wearing these t-shirts and seemingly celebrating black women as um, the quiet labor of keeping the American machine going and what that does to a commoditized version of black feminism that is no longer potentially as concerned about the revolution and as concerned about revolutionary freedom and can be commoditized and placed on a t-shirt and used as a articulation of white liberal uh, assuagement of guilt for not paying attention for so long or of not placing black women in positions of power and authority to actually do not only work but to live their lives fully and freely. And so, I'm increasingly concerned with, with not uh, just forgetting that black women told you, but actually remembering, and remembering it in a way that actually turns it into something that can be bought and sold instead of something that actually does the work of undermining uh, the hegemony in which we live right now. All right. Can I On that yeah. answer yeah. really yep, quickly yep, yep, that yep. question? I'm afraid that the American news media has not learned the lesson of 2016. Uh, when I look at the reporting teams that are being trotted out for the 2020 election, and I do not see any people of color, I do not see any black people in particular on these teams, on CNN and CBS thus far, you know, MSNBC, uh, ABC, NBC, you've got some time to get it together and not make the same mistakes. Um, I'm concerned that we have not learned, we didn't learn with Kerner, we didn't learn at the turn of the 19th, 20th century rather, um, we are not gonna learn in time for 2020 if we don't get it together and really think about the value of placing people with diverse experiences in the newsroom, listening to them, taking seriously their editorial judgment and creating news that is reflective and responsive of the times that we're living in. You good? Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you to my panelists. Did y'all appreciate that? Can we get some love for our panelists? Thank you. Dr. Catherine Knight Steele, Dr. Desmond Patton, Dr. Meredith Clark, Dr. Andre Brock, thank you so much for your time. And with that, I will, I will turn it back over. And thank, thank you. you for your moderation. <laughs>